from earlier. We'll start as soon as we can. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We just wanna welcome you to our fifth night of our series, Jesus is the One. My name is Elder Annette Barnes. I will be your moderator this evening. We're just so happy to have you with us this evening. We had a bit of a storm earlier, um, but God is good. We are able to be on tonight anyway. And so we just wanna praise God this evening. So we are meeting for seven more nights throughout this series from seven o'clock to eight o'clock. We meet every evening except on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we will not meet tomorrow night, but we will come back on Friday evening. These meetings are being live streamed on Zoom and on Facebook Live and all participants are muted. So we ask that you keep your videos off as well since we are recording these meetings. You will be asked to pr uh, participate during the presentation tonight. Um, by answering questions and asking questions in the chat on Zoom and on Facebook. So we look forward to an interactive session. We've had some really good sessions these last few nights, a, a lot of interaction, and, and that just really to helps make this uh, much more lively. So to ask a question or to answer a question, you can go to the bottom of your screen on Zoom and just type in the chat box, or you can comment on Facebook Live. You may also text 518-217-5599 if uh, you would also like to text your responses in. So our speaker this evening uh, is no stranger by this time, but if this is your first evening, uh, he is Pastor Miguel Crespo, and he loves to share the good news of Jesus with those around him. Jesus Christ has changed his life, and he wants to invite you to experience that change yourself. Jesus is the one. So tonight's topic is the unfinished story, the unfinished story. And before Pastor Crespo begins his presentation, why don't we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have uh, to read your word, to study it, to learn more about the parables that you told. Uh, we just are, are so thankful that we have this opportunity to come together in spite of the storm, in spite of the pandemic, in spite of all the things that are going on in our lives, that we have a chance to pause and to come here and to, and to connect with you. So I just pray that you would send your Holy Spirit into uh, each of our hearts, into each house um, and location that is listening tonight, that you would be with Pastor Crespo as he presents this evening, um, that uh, your name would be honored honored and glorified, and your words would be spoken. We just thank you and praise you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. So Pastor Crespo, what do you have to share with us tonight? Well, good evening, uh, Elder Barnes. Uh, good evening. And also to everyone who's joining us, uh, as, we, as we get started again with our study this evening, let me just repeat uh, once again, uh, I don't know, you know if, if someone's on for the first time or not, um, we're just doing a very uh, basic study of the parables of Jesus in our time together. My hope, my goal, my wish is for you to get a better view, a better understanding of Jesus, uh, of yourself, and even of how the enemy works. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, in, any, in any battle, if you know how the enemy works, you're that much better prepared to withstand them. And there's that, I believe that that principle holds true even in the spiritual walk. If you know 
or if you have an idea of how the enemy works, of what are the things that let you know that he's near, um, you can be better prepared to deal with it. Uh, I want to let you know before we get started, and I know uh, that Sister Annette mentioned it, we are having challenges with the weather. The internet's creating some havoc. So uh, hopefully, you know, we. I'm going to pray before we get started, just to pray specifically that the technology will work. Um, we want to make sure to, uh, as, as we go through this study, again, what, all we're going to do is we're going to break down a parable, try to understand the parable better, and then ask three questions at the end. The three questions are, what does the parable tell you about God? What does the parable tell you about the enemy? What does the parable tell you about you? After we break that down and say, what is your takeaway? What do you think God is trying to teach you? And one of the things, that I, and I've, I've said this over and over again, one of the reasons why I like having an interactive type of uh, presentation is that it's not so much about the speaker speaking and trying to be eloquent. It's more about putting things out there and letting God speak to you. So we read the word. We, we do ask questions because, I mean, that's the best way to learn, right? But the answers don't necessarily have to come from people. They need to come from the Holy Spirit. And as long as it doesn't, doesn't contradict what you find in here, you'll be good to go. And if you understand Jesus, if you get a glimpse of who he is, your life will never be the same again. Okay, so um, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and get started. Um, again, uh, uh, this is going to be a little bit different tonight. The parable is a little bit longer. Uh, sometimes what I do is I'll read the parable I'll kind of give a little bit of context and then read it a second time. I'm not going to do that this time just because it's a little bit longer. What we're going to do tonight is I'm going to give you the context. I'm going to share with you what's going on. And then we're going to read the parable. And, and uh, uh, I'm going to throw in just some things as we go through because it's long just to talk a little bit. Uh, I'm going to say this. If when we're reading through the parable, if a thought jumps out at you as we're going through these verses, feel free to type that in. Type in whatever thought jumps to your mind, because I think it's going to be important. Again, I want all I want you to do is to process it. Think about it. Let the Holy Spirit allow you to see things as you read it. So let me, let's, if you have your Bible, this is what we want to be using, or your electronic device, or your cell phone, your iPad. If you don't have a Bible, I almost forgot, Annette, I forgot, Sister Annette, to bring this up. If you don't have a Bible, we want you to have one. And so, Sister Annette, can you tell us, tell our, our those watching, if you want a Bible, what do you need to do? Absolutely. Uh, so it's very easy to uh, get a physical Bible. If you are looking for one, all you have to do is go to our website at joyoftroy.org slash knowjesus joyoftroy.org slash know Jesus, or you can text 518-217-5599 and just put free Bible in the text with your name and your mailing address, and we will mail that out to you. On the website, you do the same thing. You fill out your name and your address and say that you want a free Bible, and we will mail one out to you. Um, so that is how you can get a free Bible this evening. So back to you, Pastor Crespo, and I think you were going to have a, a word of prayer before we started. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, we're, we're going to have a word of prayer. Uh, we want to pray uh, for God's Holy Spirit. We also want to pray for the technology to, to work. So yes. let's bow our heads together one more time. Uh, Lord in heaven, oh Father, um, you know that uh, I, have, I've, I have nothing good to bring. It's really only as your Holy Spirit attends the reading and the listening and the processing of your word that people's hearts can be encouraged tonight. Lord, I pray that each person comes away with just a better understanding of your scripture, of you, and that we have maybe even a better understanding of, of ourselves. Be with us as we study. I pray for the technology, Lord. Uh, the weather has been bad, it seems, across the state. And so we put the program into your hands, and we pray that you do with it what you will. And we thank you for the results ahead of time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, all right. So I got I got uh, just so someone had sent me something about I got a text on my phone about being spotlighted. So you can see the bigger I, I see every all the different boxes in my screen. So just a, just as a as a note, if we can make that make that bigger, um, 
but we're gonna we're gonna go on nevertheless. Okay, so if you have your Bible, I, hope you do. I want to encourage you to turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, we're going to go over the parable that Jesus told that is often referred, referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. Um, as we've been doing the whole time we've been together, I really want you to don't don't get don't get spiritual yet. Don't 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 automatically think about it and think about yourself. I would like for you to put yourself in this place in this time in scripture if you if you use your imagination see the scene try to figure out what's going on even under under the the, the words that are being said so you can get a flavor as to what's going on so the first i'm going to give you context here luke chapter 15 verse 1 and 2 let me read these to you uh, this is what the scriptures say it says then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him and the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So verse 3 says, So he spoke a parable to them. Now, Jesus spoke several parables. We're going to go to the parable that starts in verse 11. So let's back up. First of all, we know who's going to be speaking, right? It's going to be Jesus. Jesus is telling stories. Jesus is telling a parable, a story with a lesson. Who is he telling this story to? And that, that's for you for, for, for you online to give me an answer. We read the, the beginning of the chapter. Who is Jesus about to tell this third parable to? Yeah, so that's a good question. While we're waiting for answers to, uh, to come in, um, it, it seems like uh, that this is a, some, the same text that we looked at the other evening. That's so maybe right. he's he's speaking to uh, some of the same people. Yeah, here we have tax collectors and sinners, sinners and tax collectors and other followers. Okay, uh, so is it that, seems is like that all you got? Came, that so far, that's all we have. Right. Well, let me, um, let, me, let me let me give yeah. you let, let me give oh. you. Some, oh, what do you got? Both the priests, the the priests. We have priests that just showed up. All right. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say it looks like there's some Pharisees involved in here. And well, if you, if you read the scripture, right? So, so let, me, let, me paint, let me paint a picture for you. And, and for, this, um, for this, we're going to have to use our imaginations, okay? Um, one second, someone knocked on my door, and it, they would only knock if it was really, really important. Can you just bear one, one minute? Oh, certainly, certainly. So uh, while you're while you're doing that, we're getting more in here. Uh, everyone that's there, yes, everyone that's there. So we have tax collectors, sinners, Pharisees, and teachers of the law. Uh, so it seems okay. like there's a lot of people that are that right. are here. So 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 this is what I'm I'm going to ask for for you all to do. This this comes easy for me because I'm very imaginative. Some say I'm a child, <laughs> uh, immature, whatever whatever works. But I want you to use your imagination right now. And if you need to close your eyes, you know, whatever works. Think about this. Jesus is having a get together. And, and maybe they, it says here, it says here that he receives them and eats with them. So Jesus is having a, a meal. He's having a, a, a get together with, with sinners, tax collectors, and then there are also Pharisees and scribes there. So I want you to think of this gathering. Yes. Um, if you're not familiar, we went over this last time, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I, I need, uh, I believe it's important to get really, to get a sense of what's happening here. When we're talking about sinners and tax collectors, we're talking about people who, who were Jews by birth, but yet their choices in the eyes of the general community had kind of put them outside of the favor of God. They were sinners. You would have had prostitutes that were there. You would have had people that, that were drunkards or were former drunkards, former prostitutes. You would have tax collectors there. Why tax collectors? Why do they mention them separately? Folks, tax collectors were some of the most hated and reviled people in the Jewish culture because they betrayed the Jewish family wow. for money. Right. Okay, wow. please, please remember that they betrayed the family for money. 
the sinners, they betrayed the, the, the commandments of God for whatever else it might be. It could be money, it could be pleasure. Uh, but they but they basically were were outside of the of the law and the and the main culture. Imagine, imagine Jesus eating with these people, and, and it says he's receiving them. Jesus was actually connecting with them, connecting with these people. Um, the, the Pharisees come on the scene, and imagine a hush coming over the room. Because you could tell by the look in their eyes that they're not happy. They're not happy mm -hmm. because they're looking down upon these people, and they say, Jesus, and they're critical of Jesus for hanging out with these sinners. They had no love for Jesus. They didn't like Jesus. But this scene gave them an opportunity to criticize him. Now put yourself in the place of one of these, quote, sinners or one of these tax collectors. What's Jesus going to do? If you remember a story, for those of you that are familiar with the, with the scripture, Peter was sitting with a bunch of Gentiles when some Jews came. As soon as Peter saw them, he began to act different towards the Gentiles, where before he was mm. eating with them and, and, and being kind of the same with them. But when the Jews came, he kind of stepped back a little bit like, you know, mm, I, we're not the same. I can't do that. Would Jesus do that at that moment? Would Jesus abandon his brand new group of friends because the Pharisees were here? These are, these are the spiritual leaders of Israel. What's going to happen? This moment is pregnant with something. Something's going to happen. Imagine your whole life, your whole adult life being told you're no good. You're a dog. You're a sinner. You don't have God's favor. And for this brief moment, you have someone that you believe. You believe in. You believe in Jesus. You have someone who's who's treating you as if you were the only one in the world. You're special. You belong. You, you, you have that experience for that moment. And with the Pharisees there, there's a very real possibility that this party is about to come to an end. Mm. That is the context that leads into Jesus telling the story. So let's read it. Again, I'm going to read it just one time through with some commentary just for time's sake, because it is, a, it is a little bit longer. And know that we already went through the first two, but Jesus actually told a series of parables that had some of the same points. But this one was the third and the longest. And I can tell you, we could spend, we could spend a week just studying this one. So I'm, I'm kind of doing a, a, a quick run, but I pray that the Lord will, will just open your eyes and mind to all the possibilities that are in this story in terms of scriptural lessons. So let's read. I'm going to start at verse 11. Uh, before I do that, let me ask you to do one thing for me. I know you're going to think I'm crazy. And you're probably right. <laughs> I need you to choose a character. I need you in your mind to be either a Pharisee, a tax collector, or just a sinner. And when I mean a sinner, I don't mean, you know, I'm an upstanding person. I, I, I make mistakes. No, I'm talking about a prostitute, a thief, uh, um, you know, you don't smell good. You know, you haven't made good choices. Uh, just, you know, everybody looks at you and they know that, hey, you're not an upstanding citizen. I need you to pick one of those three. Uh, and, and Sister Annette, because you are a church leader, you're going to yes. be a Pharisee tonight, right? Okay. I need you to, to be coming from the aspect that you were critical of Jesus and that uh, you don't like those people that he's with and you don't like him, but you're critical of Jesus. Wow. So think, think from that perspective what this might mean to you. But those of you watching, pick somebody. You're either a tax collector. You sold out your nation for money. Okay. Think about if you're just a sinner, you sold out your, your God. You sold out obedience to, to the culture, to, to what God has given for, take your pick, pleasure. Uh, maybe you were abused as a kid and you just had this, you just went your own way out of just stubbornness or rebellion. So pick a person and we're going to, now I want you hear the words of Jesus and see what it might mean to you. So let's read. We're going to read verse 11. Um, let's go here. Uh, Verse 11 says this, then he said, and this is Jesus speaking. He said, 
A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Um, in our culture, this doesn't mean as much as it does in the, in the, in the Eastern culture. If, if in that Middle, Middle Eastern culture, a son asks his father for his inheritance, he's only supposed to get that when the father dies. For the son to say, I want this money, I want my inheritance, but the property, I want, I want, I want this. He's basically saying that I want you to die. Wow. Um, in, in, wow. in the Middle Eastern culture, you've heard of honor killings, probably. You've heard where, where if someone shames the family, even today, if someone shames the family, the, the, the answer to that is to kill the individual a lot of the time. You may have even heard where even in the United States, someone is arrested because they killed their child because they dishonored the family. You may even hear stories of someone who dishonors the family in the Middle East, travels, say, to the U.S., only to find that sometime later, someone from the family travels following them to kill them to restore the honor of the family. In Middle Eastern culture, they, run a, they, they live by a very strict code of shame and honor. If you bring dishonor to your family, if you bring shame to your family, and this right here, friends, this would have been a high insult to the head of the family. I wish you were dead. I want the possessions that come to me when you die, I want them now. He committed an act worthy of the death penalty of stoning. You need to understand that to get the rest of this. Um, and the Bible says that the father, the father gave in to the wishes of this younger son and divided to, to all of his children his livelihood. So we're going to keep going. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Um, something that we don't talk a lot about in the, in, in the, the mind of, of many of the people back in those days, gods were geographical. In other words, if you entered into the land of Israel, you entered into the land of the God of Israel. If you left Israel, you were leaving that territory, not just the territory, but leaving also that God. This young man rejected his father, rejected his family, and he also rejected his God. And he took the hard-earned work of the father, which was converted to some type of currency, went to a far country and wasted his money with prodigal living. In other words, living opposite of what God calls for us to live. So let's use the Ten Commandments as an example. Okay, so that this is the story of this young man, what he did. What he has done is turn his back on his father, his family, and his God, all of which in those days were death penalty offenses. So let's keep going. Um, verse 14. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land. And he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his field to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Again, if you, if you understand a little bit about Jewish culture, um, you know, the Bible is very clear. Pigs are unclean animals. They're not supposed to eat uh, swine's flesh. They're not supposed to touch. They're not supposed to be around it. Pig farming was not something that Jews generally did. Um, but here he finds himself from a family that had means, a father who had wealth, to now spending, wasting the wealth. Now he finds himself with nothing, and he's feeding pigs, and he's so hungry because he has no, no friends now that he has no money that he would eat the, 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 the garbage that they would feed these pigs. This is how low that this, this individual has come. He's friendless, and I'm going to make up a word. He's foodless, okay? Doesn't have any friends, and he doesn't have any food. Now what's going to happen? Verse 17. Verse 17 talks about when he came to his senses. It says, but uh, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. 
I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Again, we may read this and not realize what's happening here, but the son is preparing a speech for the father. Remember, what he did was a death penalty offense. His father would have been perfectly within his rights to drag him before the leaders, tell them what he did, and they all stone him to death as an example to all the other young people who think that this is something that they could get away with. In making a decision to come back home, he was risking death. And so he prepared. This is a prepared statement. It's not just something out of the sky. He wanted to come to the Father and, and hopefully appeal to his better nature. Don't, I don't need to be a family. Hire me as a servant. Just, just, uh, it's better. I would rather be a servant in your house than to be a king out there, which is nothing. This is what finally he comes to his senses and he decides that he wants to come home. Now, there's no guarantee he's going to be forgiven. He's risking stoning. His words are going to need to be just right. And, and who knows? What he did was that bad. Let's keep going. Verse 20 says this, And he arose and came to his father. But when, his fa well, excuse me. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. And had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Picture this scene. He has disgraced this family, dishonored the father. When the father sees the form of his son, the gait, the walking, you know, the, 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 how he walks, how he carries himself. But he doesn't look, he's not dressed the same way as when he left. He doesn't look the same. He looks a little bit skinnier. What does the father do? The Bible says that he had something. What does it say here? I'm going to leave it to you to answer me. In verse 20, it says the father saw him and had something for him. What did he have? We're going to wait for some answers on what the father had for the son. This is a very interesting story, especially with the background that you give. Let's see if anybody can see what that is. The father had something. Something for the son in verse uh, 22, right? Verse 20. Verse 20. Verse 20. Forgiveness. Somebody put up forgiveness. God that's that's, a, that's a good answer. I'm looking for something a little bit more specific. There's a word in there. It says that he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. Somebody put up compassion. He had compassion. Compassion. Do you remember what we were talking about? the other day when we were talking about the Good Samaritan, what is the quality that the Good Samaritan had that the other two that saw that man beaten did not have and walked by the side? It was compassion. It was compassion. The, the Good Samaritan had compassion. The Bible says that this father, he had every right to be angry. He had every right to get justice. He had every right to take revenge on this boy you can tell by looking at it, he's wasted everything he left with. The father has compassion. The Bible also says that it says he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. If, if you get an understanding of that culture, older people don't run. It's, it's a <laughs> lack of uh, self-respect. There's a certain amount of dignity in walking wherever you go and being calm. Running denotes weakness. Running denotes being out of control, uh, children run, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. Older people, people with means, they pay other people to run for them. 
but older folks don't run in that culture. It's a, it's a, it's a disgrace. It's a, another, it's another shame. But he doesn't care about that. This father sees his son. He has compassion and he runs. So let's keep going. Um, verse 21 is interesting because what we see here is that the father does not let him finish his prepared speech. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22 says, But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Folks, let me, uh, if I can share real quickly, all those things. He put, he put his coat on him. He put his robe on him. He put a ring in his hand. He put sandals on his feet. The thing you need to get out of that, if you've never studied this before, is this, is that all of those were signs, all of those were things that only family members got to have. Only servants did not wear the father's robe. They did not have the family ring or, or, or sandals on their feet. They could be barefoot, but only members of the family. So what do you think it means that he comes back, the father runs to him, and he says, Get my robe, get my ring, get some shoes on this boy's feet. What do you think that means? Now, time out, okay? Remember, a couple of things. I asked you to pick a character. Pick a Pharisee, pick a tax collector, pick a sinner. You are hearing this story. What do you think this story would be telling you if you were in that situation right now? Um, so let's keep going. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep going now. So the other thing he does in verse 23 he says, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Please do not lose sight of the fact that Jesus is having a meal with tax collectors, sinners, right? And the father is having a meal with his son who has come back from the dead. Wow. So let's keep going here. Now we're going to, now we're going to read the rest of the story. I think uh, now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music, music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Remember we talk about shame and honor? Disrespecting your father was also a death penalty offense. Keep going. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fat of calf for him. So let's back up here. Where is the older son? What's, he, what, what's the older son? The story introduces the older son. Where was he? What was he doing before he went to the house? The older son, he was outside. He was outside working. In the field. Yeah, he was outside in the field working. He was doing a good thing, right? Working hard, uh, keeping the family afloat, doing whatever he needs to do. Uh, there's a, we can get very deep in here, but just know that the guy was doing what he was supposed to be doing. Yes. He shows up and he's angry, right? So my question for our, for those of us who are, um, listening, can you share with me why was the older brother angry? What was, why was he angry? And give you All a right. minute to type in there. Tell, to talk, so share why you think he was angry why the older brother was angry. So we actually have somebody who asked a question. I don't know if you're ready for um, questions while, sure. while we're waiting for those responses, but um, somebody says, you know, this, this could go many ways. Does the son represent the sinner, the 
Pharisee or both? Who does the sun represent? <laughs> I'm not sure if you're ready for that question yet. <laughs> no, but. I, I think, I, to be honest with you, I think that the Bible and the Bible stories are like a diamond. Depending on which angle you look at it, you're going to get a different view. All of the views will be beautiful. So it could, it could be either or. For the, for the purpose of, of understanding the parable, what I would say is this, follow the whole thing through. In other words, you're not just, you, you won't just pick one thing. It's got to be tied to a larger picture. So, for example, uh, we'll, we'll get, we'll get, when we get to the end, we can talk about who they might represent. But, yes, it can be that one, the other, or both, depending on how you're looking at it. Because remember we talked about the parables of Jesus. They all, he tell one story, and it have many different meanings depending on your perspective, the listener's perspective, where they were coming from. That's just because Jesus is a master teacher. He knew how to do that because he's God. So, so question, what, okay. what was the reason that the, that the older brother was angry? Why was he angry? All right, we have some answers that are coming in for that. Um, one is he was not celebrated like his other brother. Okay. Right. And then another one is because he had been honoring his father the whole time. And his father is happy that his brother came back and forgave him. So he was unhappy about that. Right. If, if, you, if you read the, the, the explanation of the older brother, the older brother is jealous, right? Yeah. Oh, here we have another one. The second son was working for his father the entire life and was angry that the younger was forgiven and restored. Right. You know what's interesting? In a culture that is strictly, that, that lives by a strict code of honor and shame, he wasn't angry that the son dishonored the father. Is it possible to be in the father's family and your heart not be right? Mm. He was more worried about his what he did not get, as opposed to the embarrassment, the potential dis dishonor or shame that the son brought to the father. That's it's it, it tells you, it gives you a picture into the heart of the person. Um, what do you notice about the father's response, by the way? What do you notice about the father's response here? And, and before we do that, let me let me finish reading. I'm sorry, I, I kind of got ahead of myself. That was a question after this. Let me read the rest of this. So he's angry. Okay. Father comes out and he yells. He's pretty much arguing with the father. In verse 30, he says, as soon as this, he wouldn't even say it's his brother. He says, as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, this is the father speaking. I said, son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again. And was lost. And is found. What do you notice about the father's response? Uh, we have one already. He went to meet both sons. Oh, that's interesting. So the father went to meet the first son when he came back. And then the father went out again to his other son because his other son was also not in the house. Neither son was in the house at some point. Yeah. But what else are, can we The see? father, well, you got another one? No, not yet. Okay. We'll look. Um, Go ahead. The father, I want to make sure that we're kind of keeping track of time here. Um, the father showed compassion to both sons. I, as, as was stated, um, remember the, the whole the whole purpose of this study is to get a picture. We want to know what the parable tells us about God, what it tells about the devil, what does it tell us about us. You, you please be thinking about those things as you as you read the parable that Jesus tells. Uh, in this parable, in this parable, this father has a son who's outside. And a son who's inside. But both hearts have problems. The son on the outside comes on the inside. The son on the inside stays now on the outside of the house. He does not want to go into the house. Because the one that was outside came in, so the one inside now wants to go out. 
because I, I think I just confused myself. But, <laughs> but you get what I'm saying, right? I think we got it. Yes. <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Um, let me let me let me ask the next question. So we know who said it. We know who he was speaking to. I asked you to put yourself in the position of one of these people. All right. There were actually three groups in here. There was well four groups of the scribes, but Pharisees, tax collectors, and sinners. Those were the three that were jumping out at me. Um, right. By Jesus telling this parable in this setting, what do you think he was saying to these three groups? Let's start with the Pharisees. What do you think he was trying to tell the Pharisees? All right, that's a good question. We'll see. Um, we, we have some other responses that have come in before. The father gave both his sons the chance to become right with the family. You know, it's interesting. You ask what, what um, he might have been trying to tell the Pharisees, and I've been thinking about it, you know, try, as, as a Pharisee this time, right? Um, that, that the Pharisees might also need some help. They might also be outside of the family and not realize it, which is a scary thing to think. Uh, here's one. You work for me, but you do not truly love me. Mm. Does that matter? Is that important? As long as you do good and, and work for God, do you really have to love them? That's a that's well, it's easier. <laughs> it's I'm, easier I'm to asking work. it for thought, not because it, I I question that. Um, no, can, no. Can 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 you can you see, for example, in the story? Again, here we go. The ingredient that the father had that the older son did not have was compassion. He didn't have compassion. The father did, the oldest son didn't. What else do you think, anybody else want to add, what do you think he was trying to tell the Pharisees by relating this parable to them in the, at that setting? Well, someone who said, once you love someone, you love them in spite of how they behave. Okay. Do love you... takes risk. Go ahead. Love takes takes risks. When you genuinely love, you take the risk of not having that love reciprocated. That's how God loves. He takes that risk by way of free will. Somebody else said not to be selfish. All right. So we're getting mixed in some 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 main lessons and 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 also what what the story might have meant to the Pharisees. I I find it interesting that Jesus is at a feast with sinners. Outcast, if, if listen, if these sinners were wanting to eat and be with Jesus, it's it says that they were out there and now something is drawing them in. They want to be with Jesus. So they've come in, but these Pharisees now who've been serving God their whole life, they come in and they're appalled by what they see. Jesus tells the exact same story. The exact same thing is happening. The, the father receives this wayward child there's uh, just so much happiness and joy over this right but then this older brother who's been working for his father's whole life is appalled by the situation uh, the idea the idea that that they were critical of jesus the way the brother was critical of the father they they weren't seeing that connection they lack compassion they forgot that these people were still their brothers and they were dead once and are now alive. They really should be happy about it instead of upset. Now, what if you're a sinner? Uh, I, and, I, and I separated the two out for a reason. Sinners and tax collectors. Uh, there are some things that obviously uh, they, they coincide. They fit together. But uh, what message, if you're a sinner and you're listening to this parable that Jesus is telling, what lesson or what message do you think Jesus is saying? And, and I'm going to real, real quickly remember Jesus is at a feast. The Pharisees show up. Will Jesus act like Peter did when the when the Jews showed up when he was sitting and eating with the Gentiles? Will he just start kind of just backing off a little bit, or or what? What what will Jesus do? And what does Jesus do? He tells this story. So what do you think Jesus was saying to the quote unquote sinners by repeating this parable? All right, we are starting to get responses. I will never leave you or forsake you. It's one of them. 
you know, while you were talking, I was thinking how Jesus had, this was the third parable he told in this setting. The first one was the lost sheep. The second one was the lost coin, which we covered the other night. And the third one is the prodigal son. It's, it's almost like he's hammering home um, to the sinners and to, well, to all of them, really, that this is who God is. Yeah. And, and that he really means that it's not just a passing statement that he's making that, oh yeah, I'm going to go look for lost sinners. It's, it's that I'm going to do all of this to find you. Right. And, and when you come home, this is everything that, that, that God is going to do. Um, okay. We've got more coming in. The Lord is long suffering, forgiving, and patient. He is love. He is compassion. No matter your class, you still have a chance to truly come to love God. Um, and this person chose sinner to think about because I know Jesus would forgive me of my sins. The father representing Jesus and the son representing me. Jesus will be there with open arms to forgive me. God is seeking and searching for me even when I am far away. For everything, there is forgiveness. All you have to do is seek it. Mm. Do you That's think, let, let, me, let me, again, um, I, I think in pictures, so, but if you think, think, think of this scene, maybe, is it, is it, is it possible that those sinners and, and those people were, were, were maybe expecting Jesus to change his attitude toward them when the Pharisees showed up? Is it possible that they were thinking, oh, you know, what's he going to do now? Is it possible that now, you know, well, he was nice to us, but now that the light is on him, is he going to be the same or will he reject me? But then he tells them this story. The story that, you know, you, you walked away because you were chasing something. But you've come back. And I, for one, receive you gladly. How do you think it would have made those, I mean, the terms, the Bible uses sinners. But how do you think it would have made those people feel at that moment? Um, ha have you ever had, have you ever had, say in school you have a friend but then when other people show up your friend kind of leaves you and goes off with them you ever had that happen anybody yeah. you ever you ever you ever get that sense that you know they're friends but when other people show up i'm not cool enough so then they kind of back away isn't it isn't it awesome to have friends that will stick by you through thick and thin isn't it awesome to know that i don't care what people say i'm here you're my friend. You're my family. You're my brother. You're my sister. I'm not leaving your side. This is a moment when Jesus told those sinners, you left. You've come back. All I care about is the fact that you came back. None of this stuff matters. This is powerful. That story at that time to those people in that place was powerful. It was a lesson they would never forget. Now, uh, the tax collectors. Um, it's interesting that they separate the tax collectors from the sinners. It may have been because of their wealth. I don't know. But but I, let's take the tax collectors. If you're a tax collector, um, is there anything that maybe might come to you maybe a little bit different? Or is it all so the, the same? Tax, the tax collectors were associated with the Romans, right? You know, mm -hmm. sinners were not necessarily associated with the Romans. So they kind of were in a different category, I guess. Um, so I'm kind of see, waiting to see if responses come in for the tax collector. But the tax <laughs> it, collector kind of has the worst of both sides, right? They, is, they it possible, is it possible for, you got these different groups to, to maybe say, maybe a tax collector might say, well, you know, he might forgive someone that was living immorally, but he could never forgive me. I betrayed the nation for money. Yes. Is it possible that may, you, you, you know what I'm talking about? There are people that say, well, God could forgive them, but he could never forgive me. Yes, we have a comment that says tax collectors left the family for money. That's right. And, and is it, isn't it interesting that the prodigal son is a story of a man who betrayed his family and his God because he wanted money. 
Yet, this offense, as heinous and bad as it is in that culture, all he had to do was desire to come back, and he was gladly accepted along with everyone else. Please, if you put yourself in that place, in that time, you're in a way, um, I'll use my imagination. And I wasn't there. Um, I'm not that old, but I wasn't there. But I'm using my imagination. I, 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 I could be waiting for Jesus to just separate himself from, from me and not treat me the way he did before. For the sake of his ministry, for the sake of his reputation. Um, but yet... He tells a story, and in that story, he's telling me, um, all I care about is that you came back. I, I know you were out there, but you're back. To me, the most important thing is that you came back. And, and not only have you come back, you are a full member of the family, where maybe you weren't even expected to be treated that way. Can you see how that would be powerful? Yeah. See, that would be life-changing. Something like that would make someone, I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life. No man has ever taught like this. You've heard it said of Jesus in the scriptures. Um, all right. So, so, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, we have some comments on that about how people felt. Um, one said that God has no favorites. So no matter which category you fell in, you, you might feel that God has no favorites. Uh, uh, loved can, I, can I disagree with that person? Um, <laughs> God has no favorites. Um, yes, he does. I'm one of his favorites. <laughs> you need to live your life believing that you are one of his favorites. But I, what I mean by that is this, is that God treats us all as if we are his favorites. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way, to be honest with you. But when you look at your life through the whole, to, from beginning to end, one of these days we'll be talking to Jesus and he'll explain to us uh, some of the things that we did not want to go through. But he, he, he walked the path with us. You are God's favorite. You are God's favorite. If there was only one, God would have done it just for you. That's how special you are to him. Um, so yes, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I would say it differently. I think we're always favorites. Um, yes, but I think the tax collectors and sinners may not have felt like they were God's favorites. So that's right. That's right. That. Uh, but he the, stood the by Pharisees his friends. Not favorite. Jesus yeah. speaks by that's his friends. Right. Okay, so so let's get to those three questions. We we have we have uh, okay. we're, we're a little bit short on time. Um, share with us, folks. Again, what does this story tell you about God? What does this parable tell you about God? Okay. God does not love one more than another. Um, what else? Peter betrayed Christ and was forgiven. Yes, yes, that is true. Let's see what else we've got. What does it tell you about God? I think that um, while we're waiting for more answers, that God sees everyone. Like He actually sees you, no matter no matter where you find yourself in life or what choices that you made. God still sees you, and His heart go, um, loves you. Um, there, there is a word that Jesus used in the parable to describe the Father in the parable. There is a word there that that we would do well to remember. Said the father saw the son and he had compassion. Compassion. Compassion amazing. Can, be, can be pity mixed with love, right? Um, but compassion. The father has compassion. How many people out there think that the father doesn't care about them? How many people out there have it stuck in their head that, that all he does is remember all the bad things that you've done? Um, how many people think, well, Jesus loves everybody but me because no one knows what I've done? Do you think it's an important lesson for us to get that the Bible keeps, that at least these parables that we've been looking at, this theme, God, compassion. It's what separates God 
It's, a, it's what separates God and godly people from everyone else. Compassion. It's love, kindness, pity mixed with love. God is compassionate and he thinks of you first. Uh, there's more in this parable that we can get into to explain that part, but uh, time doesn't allow us. I want to move on to the next one. Um, what does it tell you about the devil? Where's the devil in this story? For he doesn't show up with his pitchfork in this one either, Annette, uh, Sister yeah, Annette. He does. He so, so is he not? Is is the devil not in the story? It seems to show up as maybe the older brother. Oh, somebody said in the two sons, both sons. When the boy left and spent his money, the devil is the doubt that the son has. He's reluctant to come back. Uh, the older brother, when the other son was jealous. Okay. All right. We're, we're seeing this. Let's 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 take let's take those two. I I, I want to draw this I want to draw this out again, and that is this that some of us are waiting for the devil to show up in person, and then we'll get our spiritual act together. Some of us are waiting for for these great big things to happen, and then we're going to get right with God. Folks, someone mentioned the word doubt. When you have doubts about who God is, you are giving ear to the devil. When you have doubts about whether or not God loves you, is willing to forgive you, will look if if you doubt whether if I if I truly I, I I need God in my life, I'm sorry I messed up again. If you have doubt that He will just not listen to you, then you're listening to the whispers of the enemy. Jealousy. If you have if 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 the motivations that you have come from the root of jealousy, then you are having more in common with the enemy than you do with the heavenly Father. See, we need to recognize not just when the devil shows up, but when the attributes of the enemy are there. Because if the devil showed up in person, you'd get your act straight. If the devil showed up in person, you'd fall on your face before God, and you would not get up until the devil left. You'd be praying there the whole time. He knows that. So instead, he insinuates ideas, emotions, uh, statements made by people, sometimes people who are supposed to represent God, like the Pharisees. They were supposed to represent God, but yet they were making people feel like they were less than, that they were not part of the family. You need to learn how, how to recognize when the enemy shows up so that you don't give place for him in your life. Does that make sense? Any other, any other uh, thoughts on that, on, on the enemy? Yes. Uh, somebody said, we're all a bunch of spiritual procrastinators. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's so true. there was some thought about greed um, as well and anger that the brother had that the devil showed up. And Very good. Yeah. Greed. It's a greed, doubt, jealousy, anger. Okay. Yeah, fear, worry, uh, depression of, yeah, depression because, you know, one was considered more favored. I, I want to ask you, those of you watching, are any of the, are, are you finding yourself being controlled by any of these things tonight? Whether you, some people are angry, could be angry at a person, could be angry at God. Some people are, some people are worried more about money than they are about their spiritual condition. You know, what, what is keeping you up at night? Are you concerned about the fact that, you know, I want to get to know Jesus more? Or are you concerned about the fact that I need to make more money? Uh, what is it? All these things, we need to recognize the enemy when he shows up. Um, we're, we're getting close on time. We're probably over time now. Um, let, me, let me ask the last question. What does this parable teach you about you? In other words, is there something that you would like to share with those who are on that may be a, a, um, a, a lesson that you, that you think God has maybe impressed you with that you can take out of this study of this parable? All right, we're going to wait for a few responses. Someone noted that all of those things that we talked about that the devil shows up in are opposite of spiritual gifts. Mm. Oh, God, yeah. Mm. Um, and we all have that tendency. Okay, so here we go. How much God loves me. 
that's where we can see ourselves in the story. Okay. Any others? We're all like this. Um, there's, you know, only we don't we don't go through a day without cares and worries. That teaches me there's nothing more important than God's love and faithfulness. God always impresses us each day. We see how He is working in our life. I think maybe folks um, can see themselves, and I can see myself as the prodigal son, and sometimes as the older brother too. Depending on the day, here's one I need to surrender. Yeah, I I I, I think I think it's the, if we're if we're going to be honest, we all go through that. Some people are proud of their humility, <laughs> and they <laughs> think they're more humble there than everyone else. So they they look down on everyone else because they're not as humble as they are. Um, I, I know people like that. Um, you know, I'm not one of them. You know, of course not, because I don't do that kind of stuff. I have no problems. Uh, that that was a joke. Um, <laughs> all right. So so let me let me ask a question here. I want to I want to bring this to a close. Um, I'm, I, you know, a thought that struck me. What do you think? What what if the father had a third son? What if, what if he would have had a third son and that third son said, you know what? I'm thinking I want out of this place. I, I, I want to I wanna go out there and live my life. Hmm. What do you think, brother? And he was talking to the prodigal son. What do you think the prodigal son might have told that, that, that third younger brother who, if he had thoughts about maybe going off on his own and, and leaving the family? Uh, what type of words do you think the brother would have? Mm, don't follow me. Don't do what I did. Don't go. It's rough out there. <laughs> Talk him into not leaving. One of the if if there is a silver lining to being a prodigal son, and I'm not glor I'm not trying to glamorize living apart from God because it's too many scars, too many things that you carry. But if there is anything that is, if God can do anything good, it's this, is that is that your testimony, sharing with other people what God has done with you, through you, to you, can maybe save untold heartache to other people. Um, I, th I think about that. I think about maybe what God has called us to do. Um, God is worthy of your love. He's worthy of your love. God is worthy of your obedience. I I I want to I, I want to just you know just share with you tonight. Studying these parables is not just something academic. I really I really pray that as we're just reading and talking, that you're hearing God's Spirit just teaching you things, showing you things. It, it's it's for you. God wants to teach you. He wants to help you. He wants to change you. Um, there may be some people who are like the prodigal son right now. Uh, there may be some people who, who have gone down the wrong road and, and they're on their way back and maybe even wonder if, maybe wonder if God will really accept them. Or, or maybe you go to church and you see all these people and say, I don't know, I, I don't know that I can be like this. Will God accept me if I'm not like them? Which, again, is a, is a fallacy anyway, but these are the thoughts, these are the thoughts that go through your mind. I'm not saying that that's a real thing because we're all broken. I want to invite you to recommit your life to the Father tonight. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, if you reach out to the Father, God will come running to you. He will come running to you. Put his arms around you. He doesn't want to talk about the past. He wants to talk about your future. Entrance, restoration, being a part of his family again. That's why I, no matter how bad I mess up, where else am I going to go? Because only God has the words of life. I want to I want to present this Jesus to you. Jesus is the only one, not just the one. He's the only one. I want to have prayer. Um, can we pray together? Let's pray, Lord Jesus. Um, I want to thank you that you care enough about us. You know everything about us. Yet, it doesn't matter. You love us anyway. And no matter how far we've gone, Lord, if someone makes a decision to, to call out to you, if someone reaches out to you, that that's all they need to do. You come all the rest of the way because that's who you are. Oh, God, 
Help us to have your heart of compassion. Help us, just like you care for us and show compassion to us, help us to be willing to show compassion to others. Help us to be your hands and feet, Lord. Thank you for the study of your word. Lord, if anything good has happened in anybody's heart tonight, let them know that it's the Lord Jesus, it's you and your Holy Spirit who's reaching out to them. Thank you for this privilege you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that presentation and that discussion. Um, I think it's so important that we are reminded of who God is and that no matter where we are in life, um, that he welcomes us with open arms and that he wants us to bring us back into the family and into the fold. I hope you will give us just a few more minutes. I know we were we are over a little bit, but um, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we want to give away a free book called Christ Object Lessons which delves into the story that we talked about tonight, as well as many of the other parables of Jesus. So we want to invite you to go to our website at joyoftroy.org slash knowjesus and request your free book. You can also request some other free items that are there as well, including a Bible. And um, there, you can also text 518-217-5599 to receive your free book. If you would like prayer or Bible study, um, please also text your phone number to 518-217-5599, and uh, we will get back with you to pray with you and uh, or to set up a Bible study with you. Um, at this time, I actually would like to invite a special guest on this evening, just for a few moments, um, Elder Bill Moody. Uh, he is going to be doing a, another presentation after this series is over. Um, on the footsteps of Paul. And if you are enjoying this series on the parables of Jesus, I want to invite you um, to register and to sign up for the footsteps of Paul. It's right there on our website at joyatroy.org, the very last menu item. And um, Elder Moody, are you, uh, are you still with us tonight? Yes, I am, Elder Annette. Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Go right okay. ahead, please. So I just want, I want to personally invite each and every one of you, um, October 18th, we're going to get started going through a series called the foot in the footsteps of Paul. Um, I don't know what your familiarity is with the Bible, but well, one of the things that uh, Pastor Crespo has been trying to do is take these stories that are in the Bible and, and put you in the story. Like, you know, we no longer want to look at these from a, an outsider's view, but we want to read the stories of the Bible and place ourselves there. And so what we're going to do with this series in the footsteps of Paul is we're going to look at a, a one of the Bible writers is uh, look at his life and sort of trace the things that he's seen and the things that he lived and and sort of step by step try to understand why he might have written certain things in the Bible. So when we read passages in the Bible, we can understand the culture of what was going on. We can understand the history. All those things came out to, tonight in the presentation. And so we're gonna look at other stories in the Bible and just sort of bring out the history and the culture, understand why these passages were written and help us get a better grasp of certain topics. We're gonna to look at what these titles were of Jesus. Um, when the Bible calls him the son of man, or the Messiah. We're going to look at what it means to be converted. Uh, all these heavy topics. Sometimes we, we might think we know, but we want to look at and understand what did the what did the people in the in the early times, what did the early church, um, how did they understand these things? And if we can understand how they heard and responded to the gospel of Christ, then it'll help us in our walk as well. And so again, I want to invite you to continue to join us. Again, we're gonna we're gonna start this uh, October 18th, and I just pray that you're all able to uh, to attend virtually. God bless you. Oh, thank you so much, Elder Moody. I'm really looking forward to this series. Um, so uh, once this is over, I, I want to register and sign up for this as well and and go through it. So for everyone who is still with us, we would just want to thank you for tuning in with us this evening. We want to invite you back Friday night. So um, you get a break tomorrow night, but you're going to come back Friday night for Pastor Crespo's next presentation, 
which will be The Unhaunted House. So the title of the presentation on Friday, it says tomorrow night, but uh, that's a typo. It would be Friday evening at 7 p.m., The Unhaunted House, same time, same place. If you would like to uh, review some of the past sessions, you can go to our Facebook page to review uh, past meetings that we've had, uh, presentations, or you can go to our website at joyoftroy.org slash knowjesus and review some of the previous presentations uh, from the series that we've been having this week. So until Friday evening, remember Jesus is the one. Good night and God bless.